so video book series, I'd like to start with the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass by himself. This is from 1845. Chapter one. No, I did not do my hair like Frederick Douglass. Chapter one. I was born in Tuckahoe near Hillsboro and about 12 miles from Easton in Talbot County, Maryland. I have no accurate knowledge of my age, never having seen any authentic record containing it. By far, the larger part of the slaves know as little of their ages as horses know of theirs, and it is the wish of most masters within my knowledge to keep their slaves thus ignorant. I do not remember to have ever met a slave who could tell his birthday. They seldom come nearer to it than planting time, harvest time, cherry time, spring time, or fall time. A want of information concerning my own was a source of unhappiness to me, even during childhood. The white children could tell their ages. I could not tell why I ought to be deprived of the same privilege. I was not allowed to make any inquiries of my master concerning it. He deemed all such inquiries on the part of a slave improper and impertinent, and evidence of a restless spirit. The nearest estimate I can give makes me now between 27 and 28 years of age. I come to this from hearing my master say, sometime during 1835, I was about 17 years old. My mother was named Harriet Bailey. She was the daughter of Isaac and Betsy Bailey, both colored and quite dark. My mother was of a darker complexion than either my grandmother or grandfather. My father was a white man. He was admitted to be such by all I have ever heard speak of my parentage. The opinion was also whispered that my master was my father, but of the correctness of this opinion, I know nothing. The means of knowing was withheld from me. My mother and I were separated when I was but an infant, before I knew her as my mother. It is, it is a, a common custom in the part of Maryland from which I ran away to part children from their mothers at a very early age, frequently before the child has reached its 12th month. Its mother is taken from it, its mother is taken from it, and hired out on some farm a considerable distance away a considerable distance off, and the child is placed under the care of an old woman, too old for field labor. For what this separation is done, I do not know, unless it be to hinder the development of the child's affection towards its mother and to blunt and destroy the natural affection of the mother for the child. This is the inevitable result. I never saw my mother. To know her as such, more than four or five times in my life, and each of these times was very short in duration and at night. She was hired by a Mr. Stewart who lived about 12 miles from my home. So he's saying that he never met this woman um, his whole life who lived about 12 miles from his home. She was made, she made her journeys to see me in the night, traveling the whole distance on foot after the performance of her day's work. She was a field hand and a whipping is the penalty of not being in the field at sunrise, unless a slave has special permission from his or her master to the contrary, a permission which they seldom get, and one that gives to him that, <clears throat> and one that gives to him that gives it the proud name of being a kind master. I do not recollect of ever seeing my mother by the light of day. She was with me in the night. She would lie down with me and get me to sleep. But long before I, I waked up, she was gone. A very little communication ever took place between us, between us. Death soon ended what little we could have while she lived, and with it, her hardships and suffering. She died when I was about seven years old on one of my master's farms near Lee's Mill. I was not allowed to be present during her illness, at her death, or her burial. She was gone long before I knew anything about it, never having enjoyed to any considerable extent her soothing presence, her tender and watchful care, 
I received the tidings of her death, which with much the same emotions I should have probably felt at the death of a stranger. <laughs> Sorry, this is um, it's heavy. It's interesting. It's very interesting. It's, it's very heavy, and I'd like to continue. Called thus suddenly away, she left me without the slightest Im uh, intimation of who my father was. The whisper that my, fa my master was my father may or may not be true. And, true or false, it is of but little consequence to my purpose whilst the facts remains in all its glaring um, odysseousness that slaveholders have ordained and by law established that the children of slave women shall in all cases follow the condition of their mothers and this is done too obviously to administer to their own lusts and make a gratification of their wicked desires profitable as well as pleasurable for by this cunning arrangement the slaveholder in cases not a few sustains to his slaves the double relation of master and father so I just want to be uh, absolutely crystal clear on what he's saying here. He's saying that um, that slave masters raping their slave women and fathering the children who, by law, would be slaves is pleasurable and profitable. That the commerce uh, and, and even the individual sadistic pleasure um, because we all know that these slave rape arrangements are often like, I mean, I know I hate to use such a crude example, but if you think of the color purple, where Mr. Uh, M-I-S-T-E-R period is trying to um, basically rape Celie's sister, Nettie, and how he's trying to seduce her and, and make himself appealing to her. And he wants to feel like she likes him. But, you know, at the end of the day, he's just going to take what he wants, uh, which is the case here. And you hear about all the trinkets and things that the slave masters would do and promise the, the women um, all kinds of things, especially, you know, to even live in uh, the house of the um, house slave. Um, but then if you have extreme, you have, you know, the field slaves who, you know, you had an old maid to take care of them, a worn out field hand on her last leg and kids. I mean, you know, keep the, keep, the psyche weak, keep the body strong. So, yeah, this is pretty wicked. And I just really wanted that point to be crystal clear that he's saying here, and so I'll continue. I know of such cases, and it is worthy of remark that such slaves invariably suffer greater hardships and have more to contend with than others. They are, in the first place, a constant offense to their mistresses. He's talking about the offspring of the slave master and the white mistress. She's never disposed to find fault with them. They can seldom do anything to please her. She is never better pleased than when she sees them under the lash, especially when she suspects her husband of showing to his mulatto children favors which he withholds from his black slaves. The master is frequently compelled to sell this class of his slaves out of deference to the feelings of his white wife, and cruel as the deed may strike any one to be, for a man to sell his own children to human fleshmongers, it is often to dictate, it is often the dictate of humanity for him to do so, for unless he does, he must not only whip them himself, damn, he must stand by and see one white son tie up his brother of but a few shades darker complexion than himself and ply the gory lash to his naked back. And if he lisp one word of disapproval, it is set down to his parental um, partiality and only makes a bad matter worse, both for himself and the slave whom he would protect and defend. Damn. I gotta continue next time. Sim, disso, o Reginaldo Storm mandei para o Nibagrança.